You're okay, live. So recording. So I guess we're ready to get started. Awesome. Hi, hi everyone. So welcome to the Sound Girls and Women in Vinyl panel on careers in vinyl. Um, and I'm very grateful and honored that Sound Girls and Women in Vinyl have finally come together. It's I think it's such a momentous uh, panel just because I don't think there's ever been a, a webinar or panel that focuses on on the careers specifically and the fact that there's actually women and, and many of us that are part of these different um, fields. Um, so I guess we're just gonna do a quick introduction for each of us that are part of the panel. Um, I'm gonna start with myself. I'm Jet Galindo. I'm a mastering engineer and vinyl cutter based in Los Angeles for the studio called The Bakery. Um, and uh, you, Jen? So I'm Jen Eugenio. Um, I'm the sales manager at Furnace Record Pressing outside of DC. And I'm also um, the one who started Women in Vinyl. So I'm glad to be doing this with Sound Girls, um, one of my favorite organizations. And thank you all so much for joining. This is great. Um, how about you, Amanda? Um, my name's Amanda McCabe. I, um, I've been working in the music industry for about 20 years now in various aspects. Uh, recently, a uh, music history archivist and now working with uh, Universal Music Group, focusing on, um, on a new team uh, strategy and tactics for new products. That's awesome. And yeah. <laughs> Oh, all right. Your turn, Robin. Oh, me. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Robin. Um, I, uh, I hate calling myself a mastering engineer because I still feel like I'm such an uh, amateur yeah. at it. Don't, don't <laughs> say it. Yes, you are. <laughs> Claim it. Uh, so I cut uh, short run vinyl um, in Toronto um, and have been for the last uh, like year and a half. Um, I was starting to apprentice on lacquers and then Apollo blew up. And so there went my lacquering, uh, lacquer apprenticeship kind of. So, but in, I think, beautiful irony, short run vinyl became kind of a stopgap. So I've been cutting more records than ever. So um, yeah, I do that. Um, I kind of want to start a label, which is crazy. And I've been working in the music business since 2005. So that's awesome. Um and Robin is also um, one of the only uh, women cutting engineers in Canada. Is that correct? That's the one. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> and then um, Ms. Lenise Bent. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad you're all here. Uh, I'm an engineer producer. Um, and uh, so I um, don't, I create vinyl uh, recordings. And um, so all of the rest of you can um cut them manufacture them sell them play them and uh <laughs> i have an uh all analog record uh coming out in october finally um the manufacturing company rti is finally making records again for it's for a band called primal kings but the it was recorded to tape mixed to tape in the uh, lacquers were cut from the half inch two track master. So uh, there's no digital in this actual piece of vinyl. And we're very excited about that. Had a lot of fun creating it. And um, uh, there you go. And thanks for being here. I'm excited That's to be here myself. Awesome. And, and for those that um, haven't read Lenisa's profile, she's also known for her um, work with Steely Dan, um, Blondie. So look up her 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 background so it, it's awesome so oh, um we also have another um panelist that is um we're, we're still waiting for her to go online um her name is Brittany benton and as soon as she's online um uh, we'll, we'll check in with her all right so um the first thing we're going to cover is just talking about women in vinyl so um this is jen uh I, we have some questions for you so tell us about Women in Vinyl. I know it's uh, it started in 2018, two years ago. Happy anniversary. Um, so um, this has been covered in interviews uh, with you, but give us a quick background on um, why you created Women in Vinyl and why is it important that you started this? 
Yeah, well, I've been a vinyl collector for a really long time, and um, I really wanted to get into the vinyl industry, but I didn't really know how or, um, you know, where to sort of look for that sort of job. And being a fan of music, even, I didn't really know. I didn't think that there was any career path for me. I just thought I'd always enjoy music, and that was that. Um, and so when Furnace started pressing in-house in Virginia, I'm actually from this area, and I got a job there. Um, and so moved back, started really kind of seeing behind the scenes in the vinyl industry. Um, and I was seeing more and more women doing really amazing things with music and with vinyl. And I would find that you don't really see that recognition. Those people aren't really uh, at the forefront of uh, the platform. And I think vinyl's always kind of been looked at as a boys club for some reason. I don't really know why, but <laughs> even shopping at record stores, you know, I would be treated differently than my boyfriend. So, you know, or I would have a prospective client call and I would get, you know, the process explained to me. And so I was just sort of like, you know, there's so many awesome women doing things behind the scenes and there needs to be a way to highlight them and really showcase what they're doing and have a safe place and a, and a, community for women and girls to um, find role models and mentors and people they feel safe asking, how do I set up a turntable? How do I get into, um, you know, doing what you're doing without feeling like they're not in a place where they can ask that and be looked down upon. So um, I really wanted to start the blog for that purpose. And then from there, you know, it's kind of a social platform and hopefully eventually it will be a nonprofit as well. That's yeah. awesome. Um, you mentioned something about um, a meme that also yeah. uh, sparked this whole determination to start Women in Vinyl. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I always talk about that meme when people <laughs> ask about Women in Vinyl. It was so annoying. It was uh, this like 1950s couple and they're sitting there in their living room and the guy's holding the record and it's like insert any band like this is Led Zeppelin's first press, white label, blah, blah, blah. And the woman is sitting there knitting and she's like, I could care less, essentially. And it got reposted and reposted so many times and with all of these guys being like, oh yeah, I know how this guy feels. And I, it got to the point where I was just like, enough. You know, it's not about um, putting one rate, like men against women or anything like that. It's just, uh, you know, giving the recognition where it's due, you know, I'm a huge nerd. I mean, I have like, what, 40 plus variants of Master of Reality. So, you know, I'm the guy. <laughs> Actually, if you guys should um, check out Instagram, um, Jen's Instagram, she holds like weekly Sabbath Sundays. Yeah. Master of yeah. Reality, everybody, get into it. It's so good. It's yes. insane. <laughs> so, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. <laughs> So um, since opening, since starting Women in Vinyl, um, do you have a number of um, the women you've profiled on the website so far? Because on, on the website, if you guys go to womeninvinyl.com, um, Jen does a great job of, of profiling women from different facets of the vinyl industry. And all of us here on the panel got together because Jen featured each of us mm -hmm. on the Women in Vinyl website. So how many profiles have you covered so far, Jen? There have been 74, um, oh, wow. a couple more pending, um, and then some have been, you know, a couple that felt like they wanted to do it together. So uh, Banana Records in Florida, um, I think um, Maggie um, did one. So uh, yeah, a couple people feel more comfortable doing it as a duo, and I'm totally fine with that too. And if anybody actually knows anyone that they feel should be highlighted, please do send them my way. Um, the hardest part is really just getting uh, the interview and, and images back to get it posted because everyone's so busy. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know everyone by any means. And so suggestions are always welcome. I do just, I try to feature people that are working with vinyl in some way because I find that there's a lot of really great collector blogs already. And there's a lot of um, really great women in music specific um, type sites. So. I really want to show kind of the ins and outs of um, what we do to make the records that everybody loves. Just a, a quick rundown. What are some uh, jobs or careers that these women are from, um, from those that you've covered? So for example, um, 
there's mastering engineers, um, record shop owners. Um, one thing that stood out to me is the woman who runs Coco Designs. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's someone who actually has a, a company that designs um, those dividers for vinyl records. Yeah. So what other uh, jobs were covered in your profile so far? Um, yeah, I think, you know, record store owners, uh, DJs, I mean, that's a job, vinyl probably would have died at some point had it not been for DJs still. Totally. Know. So, I mean, I think that's a really important um, aspect. Um, record labels, uh, specifically that focus on vinyl. There's a lot of really great ones out there. Uh, and then, yeah, all of the things that you mentioned as well. But, you know, I think it would be interesting if we could at some point get someone that does like art for vinyl. What an awesome job that would be. Shoot. Uh, didn't oh, even yeah. So, yeah. Album cover art. Totally. What a job. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So there's all kinds of things. I mean, I think a lot of what we're going to talk about today is how many people touch it. I mean, it's not, it's not a one person thing. There's so many hands involved in getting a record out that um, I think people will see soon that there are a lot of different areas where you can get involved. So, yeah. That's awesome. So um, if you're um, following our conversation right now, if you have any specific questions about um, all of our of the topics that we're discussing, just leave it here and we're going to cover it on Q&A uh, after our discussion. So Jen, I'll, I'll let you um, hold the ball and, and just introduce each of the panelists and um, pick on the brains of, of the inner workings of each of our career paths. Yeah, so I mean, I think it would be interesting if we all just sort of went uh, one at a time and talked about maybe how you got into the industry and what your day in the life is like. Um, and I know that, you know, Amanda for one, Robin also, have had a couple different um, jobs within the industry. And if you want to kind of talk about those different facets, I think that could be um, kind of interesting. So um, Amanda, do you want to start? Sure. Um, it's funny that you guys said how interesting it would be to make vinyl art. Um, kind of early on in my career, I accidentally stumbled into owning a company called Missing Parts, where I actually did the layout and design for records uh, for independent artists. And it was really cool. It was really fun. And I literally just stumbled into it. I was playing video games on a friend's couch and another friend walked in and they were talking about this new record our friend Dave was putting out. And it was, you know, hey, how do we get this painting on the cover? of this next record and the painting is sitting there and the person I'm trying to beat in this video game and losing dreadfully um, <laughs> said, Amanda can do it. And I was like, I can. And then I kind of thought about it a minute and I was like, yeah, I could probably figure that out. Um, and that's, and then I owned a company and I worked on a number of records with a bunch of different artists. Um, and you know, in, in terms of, you know, all of the different careers and jobs and whatever that I've had in the music industry, <clears throat> I would say just being open to doing something new and adapting to whatever strange opportunity falls in your lap at any given time is probably the single um, most important aspect um, and not really allowing yourself to kind of get too bogged down in um, what you've already done. Um, I think that that carries all the way through kind of, um, you know, I worked in, I worked with record labels or did my own thing. I was a music critic. I was a DJ. I um, worked in the digital distribution sphere, the mobile distribution sphere, um, went back to school, got my master's in archiving to work on historic sound recordings and digitization and preservation, and um, which kind of led me to kind of combining a lot of those different things and what I'm doing now, which is really focused on metadata, which is a you know, really important thing in terms of digital distribution, but also physical distribution. Everything that happens on the internet and online happens through metadata. And I learned so much about that through my degree in archives. So not only did I take everything that I had built on before, and kind of wrapped it into this love of music history. But then I found a way to kind of contrib continue to contribute to making 
strides in how we um, help artists make money today in the world that we live in today and how do we keep pushing that forward um, in all different aspects whether it's final production or selling vinyl online or whatever we're doing there's always this like push to just being open to what the next thing is and that's always been kind of where I find myself and I don't know it doesn't really feel intentional but it certainly feels um, like a, a common thread through everything that I've done in working with music over the past 20 years. So I would say that's the number one guiding light, you know, be deeply passionate and just keep running after it because it's, it's always a moving goalpost. <laughs> what it looks like will never be what you expect. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Robin, you want to go next? Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything that Amanda said. I mean, it's kind of having a moving radar and just kind of seeing where you could find an opportunity where you might be able to use some of the skill set that you have. Um, or in my case, just go bullheaded into something that you're like, hey, that looks cool. Why don't I try that? Nobody does that. All right, let's whatever. <laughs> and just, I don't know find your way, luckily. Um, like um, we were talking about earlier, it's just about making your own luck and like making your life work the way that you wanted to, creating your opportunities. I mean, being open and being coachable, being somebody that people want to take along with you is, um, or along with them, I, I think has been kind of one of the easiest ways that my career has progressed it's always kind of been like do this one thing and then this thing happens and then you go this way um going back to 2005 <clears throat> i was working at a guitar store and was going to lots of shows and i kept seeing these two dudes that always looked really stern and they were always arms crossed at the front and like kind of looking at everybody and they started to see me at shows and shows and shows and they're like, Hey, you're always here. And I was like, uh-huh. They're like, do you want to get in for free? And I was like, yeah, of course I do. And they're like, okay, why don't you be the head of the street team? And you can just like be the flyer kid. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. And then from there it became, Oh, you know, stuff about gear. And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? So then I started to like take a backline from my job and set up shows <laughs> and like minor stage manage and just kind of like learned that way. And then I was the head of the crew and I was running all the guys that were building the shows and I was on stage and I was being a stage manager. Meanwhile, I was production managing. I was doing immigration for the entire country. I was being loaned out to other, um, other promoters and other uh, entities to do the immigration for their shows because historically the Canadian border, not really easy to get over if you're a musician. So luckily I had a little bit of a gift and I kind of wormed my way into that. And then it was like, yeah, just kind of do whatever you want. And then took a little bit of a hiatus and was like, hey, they press records in Calgary. Maybe I should be their social media person. But by the time I had come back off of another tour they had closed and I was like but vinyls are like huge right now and I mean I have a 3,000 piece vinyl collection myself many of yours was that <laughs> I must say Tusk is my favorite album of all time so oh. thank you for that so much <laughs> oh um, <laughs> my pleasure <laughs> <laughs> I could fangirl on you all day trust oh, me um thank you <laughs> uh, that's why I'm like why am I on this panel okay <laughs> but yeah it was just kind of like oh maybe I could fit in there and try and figure out why they closed and then between that and figuring out like the new record presses and you know that whole nightmare and then going to the first making vinyl conference meeting Jen meeting all of these other crazy people I mean there was like four women at the first making vinyl total and I was just there to like poke Mike Dixon and be like, hey, you know stuff about lids. Tell me everything. <laughs> We're going to be best friends. And he's like, who are you? And I was like, <laughs> hi, I'm from Canada. You'll love me. I promise. <laughs> and I was like, should I buy this lathe? And he's like, yeah, do it. And I was like, okay. And then came home and that started that whole ball rolling. And here we are. So 
I mean, long and short, that's exactly it. Just, I mean, if you really want it, you got to go after it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lenise? Well, yes, uh, being um, myopically driven uh, <laughs> helps. Um, uh, I, I grew up in a musical family. Um, uh, some of them were professional, some of them weren't, but um, lots of records and uh, lots of music all the time in my house. And I'm the youngest of six kids. And so I had older brothers and sisters who would uh, bring home lots of music uh, and that I got to, you know, enjoy as a small child and just was from out of the shoot, I was uh, inundated with, uh, with playing records. That was my favorite thing to do as a child was, you know, playing records, whether they were children's records or my siblings records or anybody's records. That was just that and, and listening to rock and roll and, and on a little transistor radio that was my brother's that I would sneak and and um it, you know I was I was kind of wired for it. Uh and then uh my, my oldest brother worked at an electronics store and he would bring home tube amps and things to work on and just that's one of my earliest um comfort memories and, and aromas, you know, smells that uh, conjure up memories was the uh, uh, vacuum tubes. The uh, warming up was just, uh, just a, a, still to this day when somebody fires up a tube amp or something and I could smell that, it just, you know, warms my heart. And uh, it, so started out that way. Um, grew up in Los Angeles, so I was in the Screen Children's Guild because you could put your kids to work here you know, child labor was uh, accepted on that level. And so my brother and I got to be in, you know, TV and film, cue the kids, you know. And, and um, uh, so I had an exposure to equipment and gear and technology and all of that. And just, you know, uh, much preferred doing that than instead of when they say, okay, you know, cue the kids. I go, oh no, I have to go work. Can I come back and hang out with you behind the camera? And, and I'd say, sure, you know, and that's like eight years old. And, and um, so we had that advantage here. We had Hollywood here. We, uh, so by osmosis, you know, uh, and then uh, uh, the music industry uh, and shows and concerts. My boyfriend, of course, was in a band who wasn't and, uh, at that time. And so we play, uh, he would play different clubs around and uh, we were just teenagers you know our mothers would have to drop us off and take us to the gigs and all but uh so i was kind of roadie a bit there and and uh drum roadie actually and um that's the worst one i know i know and i <laughs> he wasn't even the boyfriend but um, <laughs> but somebody had to do it yeah you know whatever needed to be done so i just uh had that awareness and then um the guitar player in one of his bands later uh, uh, was also a sound engineer for um, uh, an artist and a producer uh, named Leon Russell. And Leon, uh, who is quite iconic in the industry, um, had one of the first home studios. And so Roger said, come over and, and see this. And I was a huge fan of Leon Russell. so. I said, sure, so I'll come up. So I went over and I walked in and I, I see a console and where a dining room was supposed to be what had been turned into this um, amazing control room uh, with uh, you know monitors and faders and tape machines and outboard gear and, and fabulous sound coming out. And uh, I just said to Roger, I said, show me how to work this thing. And the next day I dropped out of university, I was studying film. Um, dropped out of university and found a recording school and signed up and then told my parents. And um, fortunately, they were cool about it because uh, recording schools were cheaper than university anyway. So, uh, but uh, anyway, um, graduated and got a, a, and I would get to go to Leon's house uh, to practice what I learned at recording school, which was a, a huge plus. And I want to share that with any of you people who um, are going to school and learning it, that isn't 
the only thing you need to do is, I'm sure you all know, embrace all opportunities that come your way that, um, you know, show up and be there and drop everything and, and go. And if you're um, as passionate as I'm sure the, the majority of us are, um, uh, you'll do it and you'll just uh, seize every opportunity. So uh, that was the biggest reason why I excelled over a lot of people was because I was having hands-on, um, you know, uh, practice as well as the safety net of a recording school and um, so when I got my job I was already uh, I, I got hired at the village studios it was village recorder back then and I assisted for three years and that's um, was uh, an extraordinary time in in making music and records and um, so I learned from the best engineers, producers, working with the best artists on the best, some of the best records ever, and um, just built my own toolbox, you know, as I uh, had the great opportunity of working with Al Schmidt and working with Roger Nichols with Steely Dan and working with um, Ken Kelly and, uh, you know, with Fleetwood Mac and uh, just so many. and. Um, um, Norbert Putnam and people from Nashville. So uh, that allowed me to be, uh, come an, an engineer on my own right uh, with producer Mike Chapman, who was a big pop producer from England and he did uh, Blondie and The Knack and all those sort of records. And he wanted to make me the first woman producer. So I said, well, yeah, okay. And, and um, popped in with him and, and as a result, um, that, uh, that one right there is, uh, I'm, I got to be the first woman to make oh. a platinum album. And, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I thank him all the time. And, um, uh, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and, and it's also the first hit rap song with music too. Rapture is on that. I've got to make that. So, um, foundations, uh, just yeah. foundations. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, it was just a blast. And, and uh, thank you. Um, uh, then I went, and so then I went into post production <laughs> and, um, and learned amazing things about sound design and all of that. And, um, uh, then got back to making records. I just missed it eventually and so I'm back producing and engineering uh, vinyl uh, is my favorite recording analog is uh, just such a joy for me because uh, because I can and I love sharing that knowledge with other people um, Carrie was uh, kind enough and we put together a, a, a um, analog tape recording uh, workshop that we still have the part three to do with with jet but um just to train people to have those skills because that just makes you more valuable to the industry um just knowing how to handle tape how to thread a tape machine run the transport edit um learn all its uh you know the paradigms of you know totally uh destructive audio it's it's a rush um but it's a lot of fun. You make decisions, and and then you have that skill set. And I'm I'm convinced that um, more people would use tape if they knew how. And so, um, and that mixed uh, anywhere from all analog to all digital and everything in between is what I do. And I even work with artists right now. My day right now is um, accessing my current uh, artists uh, uh, Luna program. She, she's using, using that software through um, uh, Universal Audio, which is like Pro Tools sort of, but um, because of the lockdown, I just wanted to share, it's, it's kind of cool. There's, uh, we access the two, um, you know, two party authorization um, formats and then I can manipulate her session on her gear at 
per place. I don't even have to have any of it. I can just have my computer and, uh, and headphones. And so we have a lot of fun with that. So it's gone all the way up to that. And um, as uh, Robin, you were saying, and Amanda, and I will just reiterate too, uh, just turn on a dime, be flexible, be uh, open to new adventures, do some, at least one thing every day that scares you that uh, that's uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said that and that's one of my mottos and um, and because opportunities are there uh, and you don't always know that that's what that is but one thing leads to another and before you know it kaboom something lands in your lap oh wow so that's what that was about so just you know persevere and be present and fo follow it sounds so corny, but it's just so true. Follow, follow your, your vision and that passion. You only have one life. And so you got to be happy. And you got to do that thing that makes you happy and, and don't put it off. Jet, what about you? Sure. Um, also, just a heads up that our, our um, last panelist is, has joined us. Brittany Benton is right here. Oh, yay. Yes. Hi, Brittany. <laughs> yes, she's Hi, Brittany. Busy. <laughs> So, um, in Hello. the, I'm sorry. Hi. So, um, uh, do you mind giving just a very quick introduction on, on what you do? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I was ringing out of order right now. Um, I'm <laughs> the owner of uh, Brittany's record shop. You see, I've got like a ton of like vinyl boxes that I need to crush behind me. Um, That's awesome. I produce, I DJ vinyl. Um, I'm a collector, just, you know, all things wax. Uh, you know, I love it. You know, like I said, we're doing some digging and stuff right now. Um, but yeah, just if it spins, you can drop a needle on it and it's funky, like I'm into it, you know? Awesome. So yeah, um, you can go back to what you're doing and, and we'll let you know as soon as like, I have questions. Yeah, later. I'll just need 30 more <laughs> seconds. I'm yeah, sorry. no I'll worries, no worries. All right. So just a, a quick background on, on how I got into what I'm doing. So um, what I always like to tell people um, who ask how I got to um, who, where I am today is when I was a kid, I don't think I ever told anyone that I wanted to be a mastering engineer. Um, that's not like a typical um, dream as a kid. But for all of us who are working here in, in, in the vinyl industry, I think the one common thread is the fact that we love music. And no matter w which direction, the point is it's like for me as long as I'm like freaking working in music and being part of the create creation process that's that's the dream and and I'm so grateful to be living um, my dream right now um so how did I get to vinyl cutting and, and mastering um I come from the Philippines <laughs> um didn't learn vinyl there and um I also grew up in a time where um like vinyl is starting to like move away and the more common is like um, cassettes and CDs. So I didn't really fully experience the, the vinyl format as I was growing up. However, um, I grew up in a family of, of um, just filled with music. My parents um, actually trained cover bands in the Philippines. Um, so yeah, I, I named Joe and Jet for a reason. Um, so we have like a, a rehearsal band, uh, like rehearsal studio at home where bands just play. So there's always like loud music in uh, at home so i just knew i wanted to pursue a life in music um but my parents who are musicians said uh you got to get a real degree first before you're allowed to do music because we know how music is a gamble um that that sort of talk um so i have a degree in psychology um and as soon as i finished psychology um i just knew i wanted to pursue music um and uh, as I was in college uh, pursuing psychology, um, I was also a very active member of, of a classical choral group. I'm actually a classical musician. That's my background. Um, even though I'm called Joan Jett, yeah, I'm, cla I'm a classical soprano. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so uh, um, yeah, uh, but uh, I just knew I wanted to um, pursue music and there's no sound engineering uh, degree or school in the Philippines. So I just knew that um, I had to be uh, surrounded by technology as much as I could until 
the opportunity comes that I could go to the US here and study audio engineering in Berklee College of Music. I knew that that's just the direction that I wanted to go. So I worked in a multimedia training facility in the Philippines teaching web design and, and nonlinear video editing and all that stuff to priests and nuns. That's, that's the opportunity that I found. So I was, I was teaching priests and nuns technology, but that just so happens that that institution also has a recording studio. And as I was being interviewed um, uh, for my position in teaching multimedia, I told them I wanted to be a sound engineer and, and I plan on, on taking formal studies eventually. And then the director said, you do know that we have a recording studio and, and we can have you intern there after your work hours. Um, I almost didn't get the internship because the sound engineer um, found out the day before that Jet Galindo was a woman. Um, that's always a story that I like including because I almost didn't make it um, to where I am today if, if, my, if I went by Joanne rather than Jet. Um, so at, at that point, it was too late for the senior engineer to say no. Um, and it just made me want to prove myself more. And, and that applies to any woman in, in audio, uh, in music. It's, we just have to prove ourselves extra hard just to um, actually make people realize that we know what we do. Um, and fortunately, it, get, it got to a point where the engineers, um, uh, I, I gained their trust and I was yeah. enough to um, just learn recording music and mastering in, in the commercial recording studio in the Philippines. So when I went to Berkeley College of Music, I was already equipped with that knowledge and I just had a very deep um, fondness for mastering. And not uh, at, when you're in, in audio engineering school, you don't exactly know where you're going to end up in because in, uh, I think uh, one of the attendees, oh, let yeah. me mute. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, uh, again, also one of the things that uh, Amanda mentioned a while ago is you just have to have passion because as you're pursuing your career path, you don't exactly know where you're going to land. Um, I didn't know I was going to be in vinyl, but I just knew that I wanted to be in music. And as an audio engineer, um, I thought that I'm going to end up um, as a classical recording engineer. Um, and I was supposed to have a job waiting for me when I graduated to be a recording engineer at the Aspen Music Festival, which is freaking cool. But my immigration um, employment authorization didn't arrive on time. So oh, oh, um, ah, I had like, what a disappointment. yeah, it sucked. And it was two days before my flight. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, oh. three months of, of like a uh, reservation for that music festival down the drain and I had no job lined up for me. Um, so, but I just kept knocking doors and, and like reaching out to all my peers and contacts in music. And for my case, it was Berkeley to help for leads and the audio engineering department connected me with um, Avatar Studios in New York. And that's how I eventually became a recording engineer for um, the producer of Sheik and Nile Rogers, who remains a good friend to this day. So I thought I was going to stay in New York for the longest time until the mastering uh, professor in Berkeley had leads on um, a mastering facility in California that was looking for a mastering assistant. And somehow, um, just because of, of passion, and again, just being... Um, extra and 100% while well in school, um, the master engineer professor um, referred me to the position. Um, so, um, and that I, was with Doug Sachs, right? Doug Sachs. So I oh, eventually became the legend. Legend. Yeah. So my my mentor is Doug Sachs, who is the man behind the mastering lab and is pretty much the um, mastering engineer known for Pink Floyd, The Doors. Um, Steely Dan, um, Ken yeah. Kelly, uh, so all those people. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get that opportunity to become a mastering engineer. And that pretty much set my whole career to that point as a mastering engineer. Because if you mentor with someone like Doug Sachs, you, you, you choose to continue that career. You don't mm -hmm. waste the opportunity. And yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to cut, help cut the vinyl record of the very last 
Pink Floyd Endless River um, record. So um, fortunately, um, when Doug Sachs passed away in 2015, uh, me and my colleagues decided to um, open uh, the bakery, which is where we are right now. And, and we still cut records to this day. So there's my story. And uh, uh, how about Brittany? Are you ready to, to like tell us <laughs> and how you got yeah. into this? I'm got sorry it. about that. Um, but <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's really interesting that um, today is kind of a full circle because I spoke a lot um, in that um, that focus piece that Women in Vinyl did about me, about my aunt uh, Sandra, who had this huge library of vinyl. We just had a memorial service today. So just oh, thinking yeah. and talking vinyl, it kind of like, it's kind of emotional because it gets me started back on, this was like the aunt that after my grandmother passed, she became like the family historian and always kept all of like the music collections. So, you know, I, I traditionally like, you know, came up with CDs and tapes and things like that. But as I started getting more into beat making and sampling and starting to realize, hey, you know, records are actually good for something. And, I, and I'd approached it from like a beat makers kind of sampling standpoint. But then the more I started buying and just listening, I started falling in love with music I couldn't really find anywhere else, you know, and especially then, eventually after college becoming a DJ, I'm thinking like, wow, some of these like 12 inches have like remixes and, and acapellas and, and different dubs that I can't find anywhere. So then I started just collecting just to, you know, it, it replaced like my bookshelf. Like I stopped collecting books and just, you know, um, but then eventually I used to date this guy and we would go digging on the weekends. It was like our like morning, like kind of weekend date thing, get up, get coffee, go to the bakery and then go get vinyl. And he would, you know, make beats every day, every day. It's so like it the was perfect always, date. Yeah. It was, it was, <laughs> totally. you know, it never, you know, unfortunately we're not together, but it was like, I never lost like my uh, appetite for digging. It was just like every weekend, it was like, I need to go up and just hit somebody's crates. And, but one thing though, that like, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the crate diggers, especially in Cleveland and the, mid to late, you know, 20 teens didn't look like me. So every time, if, if unless the, or I'd say until the owners knew that, you know, I was a, I was getting well known as a musician and a DJ, but when it was just regular of me, I'd always get followed in the, in the stores. People like, hey, do you know what you're looking for? Just kind of trying to run me out of the place like I was going to steal something. And then sometimes when I'd ask for something very specific like hip hop or do you have this or that, or maybe any like, R&B, it was like this good old boy type of pride. And yeah, we don't carry that. You know what? I'm not going to say the word in here. And it was just like, and I, and I was forced to start digging online, which I hate it. But I felt like a lot of people in Cleveland, especially millennials at one point, most of us who were in a vinyl, we had to start going online. And I got the opportunity to buy um, my friend's record shop because his bookstore was going out of business. So it was a record store. I was like, I don't know too much about the books business, but I can definitely, you know, work this vinyl. So I bought that from him um, with my business partner. And the first iteration of the record store was, um, was his shop called Young Kings. And it was like 26 crates. It was this weird, funky, unergonomic layout. And, but it was had everything from country to classical to some hip hop. I fell out with my business partner. We parted ways and I said, well, when I reopened, I wanted to focus on, you know, like black music, like specifically the stuff that you couldn't find in the other shops. Cleveland has about seven independent record shops, which is a nice size for the, you know, city. And so I said, I wanted it to be a celebration of black music at home and abroad. Like my mom's from America, my dad's from Jamaica. So I wanted to make sure I had the biggest, most well curated reggae section. I wanted to have all the hip hop, old and new, funk, soul, boogie, Afro, Brazilian, everything. And then also I wanted it to be the millennials store. You know what I'm saying? So it didn't have that kind of high fidelity complaining about the music that the kids love today. And, you know, just kind of I a love your record store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can, I'm in here right now. I think I can flip it around. But like, for example, as a DJ, like, you know, we dig in the crates. So instead of spending a lot of money on like all of these like expensive storage units, I just took a bunch of inverted milk crates, 
from some um, dude that kept, I guess, stealing them from the corner store across the street. We worked out a deal and I cleaned them up. And, you know, it's just kind of like a, a nod to DJ culture. And just I wanted people to know when they came in the shop that I'm putting all the money into um, into the music, you know, and then when you come in, here, let me turn around. Like we have our DJ set up. Actually, the DJ was supposed to be here, but he's late. So that's cool. I don't have to do this interview outside because of the noise. But, you know, just a celebration of like hip hop culture, what it is to be in Cleveland. I'm right in the hood, you know. So it's like, you know, I'm not this, you know, most of the shops are like gentrified, kind of like polished areas, but it's a lot of grit and heart right here on the, and I'm right on the corner of 65th and Fleet. So I wanted it to feel like you were hanging out in my back room where I keep my records, beat machines and turntables. And we do events here and it's just like a little funky shop, you know, um, I've, and the shop surprisingly has outlasted a couple of my music ventures, which have been like well recognized. But even when that fell out, the shop was just staying strong. And fortunately, you know, I could say that COVID in a bittersweet way, COVID and the uprisings have been the best thing that ever happened to the shop because I thought that I was going to have to close when I had to first shut down. But, um, you know, I got the women in vinyl piece, which definitely brought a lot of attention to the shop. I got mentioned in OK Player for eight black shops to support during COVID. And it just like went viral. And then the, what, the reason I say bittersweet is after the George Floyd incident, hashtag Black Tuesday became a thing. And I didn't know what it was until Wednesday. And I thought that somebody had hacked my website. So I went from moving like 20 records a week online to like 100 a day. <laughs> and, it, and it's just like, and the word's been getting out around the, sh like, around the world, like people interviewing, asking what it's like in Cleveland, like, what's my relationship as like a black woman who's a producer or a DJ or how do I connect with the music? And it's kind of, you know, the, the, the shop has been like this great kind of like table setter to open up like uh, cultural conversations. And like I say, it's unapologetically like we celebrate black culture, history and music here, but it's not like a divisive shop is for everybody to understand and enjoy and come and celebrate. But I just felt like in Cleveland, you know, which is pretty much a black city, you know what I'm saying? It was just like nothing to really showcase like culturally, like what we're all about. And you know, people like it. And so I just keep showing up until people stop coming. I know that was long winded. I'm sorry. That was great. That's <laughs> awesome. That was great. <laughs> yeah, no, you got me. Yeah, you, got you me. know. I just, you know, I love, I make beats, house, hip hop, dance hall. I listen to records all day. So it's like, I could do it at home for free or I could do it here and have some people, you know, pay for it. <laughs> so, yeah. Sure. Yep. So badass. Yeah. Oh, red. Yeah. How about you, Jen? Oh, well, to follow all of that, my story is <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, I, you know, my, to keep it really, you know, kind of short, um, I have always just loved music. I've always collected music. Um, my life, I say, was sort of led by music. I was put into ballet as a kid because I was shy. Um, that hasn't gone away. This is like terrifying for me to do. <laughs> but, um, you know, and so I literally spent time getting comfortable in front of people with music. And so it's sort of been throughout my life in different um, facets. And but I've always been artistic, and so I went to design school. Um, and so my career, you know, was textile design. Um, I designed clothes for Target, Oshkosh, a bunch of companies for wow. little kids. <laughs> and um, so, you know, but again, I always loved music, just had no idea how to get into it. Um, and I actually then transitioned into working for the design college that I went to as a career advisor. Um, so I would help students in the School of Design, which was industrial design, service design, design management, um, find jobs. And I absolutely loved it. It was really fulfilling. Um, and we had a sound design program and it always sort of intrigued me, but I didn't really know anything about it. I just would, you know, see what they were doing, finding different ways to make things on screen sound like other things. And it was so fascinating, but I didn't really get to do much with that. Um, and then when 
I left there, I sort of didn't know what to do. And I worked for a t-shirt company, sort of merging my um, want to help people by getting into sales things. I'm not a salesperson that's like what you think of as a salesperson. I'm, I care so much about what your, what your end goal is. Um, and so I, you know, kind of was combining my want to help people with my design. Um, and then again, when Furnace started pressing in house, it's actually funny. My mom found the job. She sent it to me and she was like, come home. <laughs> so, um, my partner Ray and I, we were living in Nashville at the time and he was working at United Record Pressing. And wow. we knew that we wanted to, to do this thing. And we talked about potentially trying to open a shop and, you know, when Furnace was hiring, it just seemed kind of the best combination of everything. And for me, you know, now truly it is a combination of everything I love to do because I am helping people like my day to day is truly like, what do you want your package to be? What do you want your final end goal to be? And then I work with them within their price points, within their turn times, within their design ideas, to help them with colors and things like that um, to create what they want. And so it's a combination of literally everything that I've done. And so for me, it truly is sort of the dream job to be able to work in music and combine all those other things that I really like. So, yeah, I mean, I just took a took a shot. I mean, my, you know, career is all over the place. And I recently signed up to be a mentor with Sound Girls because I feel like that volunteer aspect too, you can do all kinds of things to get where you want to be if you just keep following that thing that we've all kind of said that you love, you'll eventually find your way there, no matter how it's sort of, how long it takes or what road you take to get there. So yeah, that's how I ended up here. <laughs> so great. Well, I think cool. um, it would be interesting to sort of talk about maybe some things that people don't know about our jobs, like what um, some behind the scenes, I think, you know, is creation of vinyl is something that um, is very veiled in a way. I don't think, you know, I, so my personal Instagram is a fairly large following and when Apollo happened, and for those that don't know, Apollo uh, was a lacquer manufacturer and lacquers are what you need to kind of start the whole process once you have audio for <laughs> vinyl. And so I just put out a poll and I was sort of like, cause I said something and I didn't really get a response and I was like, that's strange. And so I said, how many of you know what lacquers are? And hardly anyone even knew what it was but there's so many collectors out there and so it made me think like well this is a whole other part of the process and a whole industry job market that people don't even know what it is so I think we all kind of have different interesting um, things that we do so maybe we could share um, some things that people don't know about what you do whoever who wants to start maybe with lackers or audio How well oh. <laughs> Since I'm the, uh, the very I'm kind of the beginning, and and um, you know, I I create the the content and uh, the media for you guys to cut your lacquers. And so, uh, what you might not know about um, recording for vinyl, uh, uh, especially if you're going analog, uh, but. Um, you have to consider the length of the songs and the length of the side and to know how many minutes um, you're going to have on a, on a side. Uh, and the, uh, the shorter the amount of time, the, uh, the more volume you can get on the vinyl. And so, uh, you know, you don't wanna pack it's not anything like a CD was or, um, well, just to know that it's better to have four really good songs on a side instead of five crammed in there and um, you'll, you'll get a much better uh, sounding vinyl record. And so you have to consider your playlist and your, um, uh, sequence when you're recording and mixing and you want your um, more vibrant songs on like the first couple songs and then um, that's why often if listening to vinyl and I am a huge this is 
there's a whole nother room in there full of vinyl. This is just like a little, little fun section, the boutique here. Um, but uh, um, if you are familiar with listening to vinyl a lot, you will be aware of the fact that the, the songs closer to the center um, aren't as um, loud and bombastic. They'll have the, more of the uh, acoustic song or something that doesn't have a lot of bass or a, a, a lot of volume in it. So uh, it will uh, accommodate that, that center part of the, the record. So that's all, all considerations that have to happen when you're actually creating the music, um, whether it's digital or analog for a vinyl record. How's that for just one aspect? Yeah, and then Jet or Robin or both. <laughs> I think Robin can, can talk about the fact that um, you were training on, on lacquering, right? And, and the whole news about Apollo, that's, that's, I think more people should know about that. That was a big issue in, in the mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was um, one of the reasons that I chose to move to Toronto from Western Canada to pursue this thing. So I got the opportunity to work at the oldest mastering studio in Canada, um, which was like, what? Oh, sure. No problem. Um, and work with the delightful, talented genie in a bottle that is Kevin Park. Um, I mean, he's incredible. He's made some of the most amazing records um, to come out of Canada. I mean, he cuts for American artists as well, obviously, but um, he's made some of my favorite records that I didn't even know until I started to look for his little KP on the dead wax. And I was like, oh my God, I totally have that one. And I love it and you made it. And he's like, why do you care that much? And I was like, because you made it. And now I know why it sounds so good, but sorry. Um, so I got a chance to work there and I, knew like this much about lacquers and stuff. I was kind of really trying to dive into what I was trying to do, which was more of the short run thing. Um, and then lacquers were kind of an add on bonus. Um, and so what happened was there was two um, providers of lacquers in the world. There was Apollo and there's MDC. Um, Apollo serviced like 80% of the market. They also provided um, the styli that go into the, the machines that cut the actual lacquers. Um, so there's like two different ways to cut records. There's cutting lacquers and then there's um, direct to metal mastering. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> yes, I totally get that. That's a jet and me joke right there. Um, and uh, so when the week before uh, my, uh, Apollo blew up, I had my interview with Jen and Jen and I were talking about my biggest like fear for the industry. And I thought that this was like a thing. And I was like, how do they not know that there's only two? And like, what happens if like one blows up or something? And then the next week Apollo blew up. So I don't want to say that I caused that and we've had this conversation ourselves, but I mean, sorry, but it blew up and it's like a complete loss. Um, and they, the, the one, the guy that runs NBC in Japan, uh, as far as I understand, just like makes it out of his house and has like a couple people that work with him. And he was like, if you weren't a client of mine before, like, sorry. You're he um we we tracked him down like we found out that he's like four hours away from like the city of tokyo yeah and yeah it's like he's just surrounded by like forestry and shrubbery it's like it's very japan i mean and that i mean the craftsmanship and all that kind of stuff that goes into the mdc's like i totally i can get that i'm not gonna talk smack about apollo um because i mean lacquers are a piece of engineering technology that is like far beyond everyone. The formula apparently exists in some different uh, iterations around the globe. I mean, there's a lot of people that are trying to figure out how to hack it, how to make it, how to figure out the sheeting machine to actually like lay the lacquer on an aluminum disc. I mean, we're probably six months, maybe a year out of anybody doing that. It's a tremendous investment. Um, for anybody to undertake that as well. Uh, I mean, to me, lacquers, 
anything cut on lacquer sounds better. I mean, I don't know if that has to do with the actual like mastering process where it's like a person doing it. I mean, the direct to metal mastering, there's some incredible engineers that do that too. I mean, there's very few machines that do DMM cuts, but the majority of them come out of one place and they do this visual vinyl mastering, which bless them for their uh, ingenuity and their, uh, how do I put this nicely? Um, adherence to like wanting to put out lots of product all the time. Let's say it that way. Um, I bless them for doing it and cranking out lots of records. Uh, I, I've heard some really awesome DMMs. I have a couple. I mean, would they be better if they were lacquer cuts? Maybe, probably. I'd but, like to um, just make a, a little aside right here. Um, yeah. Talking about when Apollo uh, blew up, we were scheduled to uh, cut our, our lacquers at Capitals with Ron McMaster. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, when that happened. And, uh, and what happened to all of the mastering facilities that were cutting vinyl was that um, they were only allowing their, uh, like at Capital, you had to be on the Capital label. You had to be uh, part of their uh, roster or they were, nobody knew what was gonna happen about uh, if any more lacquers were going to be made eventually. And they, whatever they had uh, backlogged, they were dedicating just to their clients. And, and um, fortunately, Ron, uh, because he had already worked with us, um, they allowed him to bring us in. And so we were able to cut that. But otherwise, if he hadn't been there, we, would, I don't, we wouldn't be having a record coming out in October uh, that I would be aware of. Um, what I understand is that there's uh, so many of the uh, cutting facilities have backlogs and um, yes, the machinery and all burned up and all of that, but the formula still exists. And so from what I have been told, because I have a few other projects, hopefully in the pipe happen, um, that, uh, they are hoping that we taking the formula to make the lacquer and how to do that will somehow get back into production before everybody runs out of their stockpiles. That's just what I've been told. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, fingers crossed. Of yeah, course. I hope so. I, yeah. I would love I would love nothing more than to scratch my little R2 into a real lacquer that was actually going to be plated and pressed into a you know, a hundred run or a 200 run, bless mm -hmm. me, Jesus. I would love that more than anything. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, I'll just uh, stick to cutting little PETGs and um, little polycarbonate blanks, because that's what I do, so. Um, just to also add to what Ray, um, Robin and Lenise are saying about lacquer. So probably for many of the people in this uh, panel, um, you guys probably have not heard of the word lacquer before this, this panel. So um, just a little like insider um, jargon that is worth knowing is for vinyl production to actually make the actual vinyl LP, the LP, it doesn't start out as that material. So um, a typical um, setup usually has like three main stages. The first is the lacquer, which is what um, Lenise and Robin are talking about. It's not made of the vinyl material. Um, it's not made of the, um, the one-off disc that Robin uses for the um, short run. Um, it's a different material made of aluminum disc coated with nitrocellulose lacquer. And that's, um, you use a heated stylus to cut the master on the actual disc. And then the next stage is where the plating process happens, where this disc um, gets um, dipped into a bath of liquid nickel and the electrolysis happens. And then that's how you come up with the stampers. So the stampers are then um, moved to the final stage, which is the pressing. 
um, where the stampers, uh, which is a negative of the actual music, gets attached side A, side B, facing each other, and then there's like a kokido shaped chip of vinyl that is in between. So there's like thousands of heated um, tons of pressure that presses on it, and the um, vinyl chip actually melts and molds onto the stampers. So that's like a very simplified way of describing how the actual process happens. And on, if you look at the group chat, um, just to add to what Lenise is saying about the length of the music and the quality of the music when you're delivering your music for actual vinyl cutting, um, I wrote an article about um, the whole vinyl mastering process in the Isotope website. And, and it's a pretty easy read for non-vinyl cutters. So look at that link and um, we'll try to send it again on, on Soundgirl's page. But that's a really good 101 on what the whole vinyl mastering entails. So yeah. I, I want to add one um, definition too. You, re, you referred to an LP and a lot of people don't know what LP stands for. And that stands yes, for you. long player. Um, be, back in the olden days when 78s, uh, going at 78 RPMs, revolutions per minute, um, made out of shellac or acid, you know, they break really easily. Um, uh, that was one single. It, it, there was typically only one song on a side. And um, so an LP was an album and um, had a variety of songs typically, more than one song on a side unless it was classical and it was a you know whatever it is but a long player was uh one that uh when 78s were around 78s uh had two songs on each side or maybe only one song on a side with the edison um uh discs but uh they were you bought them in what looked like a photo album and um, you open it up and it had these sleeves and then the the album uh, was, you know, side one and two, three and four, five and six, seven, eight, um, and those were the discs. So that's why we call an, a record album an album. It's um, from those days when it actually was an album. And uh, so a long player um, is one disc, the vinyl, as, uh, we kind of know what modern day vinyl is. And um, that's what LP stands for, long player. Yeah. Uh, how about Amanda and Brittany? Any like insider um, info that you want to share for people outside of the vinyl industry? Um, I mean, working in archives uh, with vinyl um, more recently, you know, you're thinking about how do you preserve, you know, luckily, you know, vinyl is the one archival form of sound recording. It's the one thing that's shelf stable that we have that we know will last. As long as we can play it, it'll still be there no matter how long. And that's a really like motivating factor in terms of keeping music coming out on vinyl because there is no other form of, of distribution for sound that, that will still be there you know, tape, you know, completely decomposes and there's just no way around that. We don't know how to, you know, deal with that, that inherent vice of the, you know, the polymers kind of falling apart and, and all of the sound sh shavings coming apart and sticky shed and all of those issues. Um, we, you know, honestly, like grooved sound recordings are, um, the only thing that is shelf stable, you know, CDs have dig digital rot, they completely just evaporate over time, hard drives, the same thing, you know, there's, so they're if you really want to, they're just yeah. data, they're ones and zeros, there's nothing musical sure. about them. The exact same for, you know, CDs and, you know, right. um, yeah, so really thinking about, um, you know, which the archival perspective is all about forever how do we how do we maintain these records of our our sound history through time forever and that's a, a huge goal and it's a huge undertaking it's like just 
overwhelming because at some point nobody really realized that sound was literally falling off of its recorded medium into the ether. And then all of a sudden we realized that there was a very short amount of time before all of the recordings that had been done <laughs> up to this point were at risk. And, you know, a lot of that, um, because the formulas that things were being recorded on were, were totally non-standardized. You're thinking about like, um, even disc mediums that weren't standardized before had a lot of problems, whether they were shellacs or, you know, all of the different formulas were just whatever, we're just gonna throw a bunch of stuff in there and then you don't really know what companies were using what mixtures. And so through time you find like all of these various problems that erupt. Um, and, you know, now we're at a really interesting point where we, we know what, we have ways of finding what all of these, uh, you know, chemical mixtures are made out of and it becomes very scientific. And we're actually at a point now where we can recreate sound through imaging. Um, and if you can imagine the enormity of that in terms of taking photographs of grooved like recordings and playing sound through things that have been busted and broken and uh, through time and they just have all of these pieces and you put them together and you take these really amazing photographs and you can recreate sound through that. Mind blowing. Um, and this is kind of the idea of preservation um, from a kind of what are we doing in, in terms of our historical record for sound. And, um, you know, my love affair with vinyl goes back as long as I can remember. And I always want to pull those threads forward and, and share music with people and share the history and the stories of different musicians and that is what compels me and that is what uh, makes me want to be part of making sure that all of these records keep coming out and people keep sharing their stories and keep performers keep making money so that they can keep doing what they do and i think it's really important so for me vinyl is the historical record for me vinyl is what makes certain that people down the road can continue to hear and experience and be part of our world and be part of our history, which is really important. And not about actually making vinyl, but more about championing and making sure that we make sure that there's a diversified um, way of obtaining all of the materials that we need, uh, like lacquers and all of the different components and making sure that those are protected, um, the, that there's a, a lot of different companies that are doing it. The more companies and the more people that are part of this industry in every aspect um, and that are doing it mindfully. Um, I know Jen and I talk about kind of different record pressing plants that are doing different things and how they look at the, the eco costs um, in terms of vinyl because vinyl is forever but it's a polymer, it's fossil fuels, it's, you know, there's a lot of kind of, there is an eco cost, but we have to think about how that balances in terms of, you know, does everything need to be on 180 gram vinyl? Maybe not because there's something to that. Um, but how do you pick and choose? And I am certainly not the one to do that, but for every leap forward, um, I think it's important that we consider how it, permeates through what we're really trying to do. Um, not just fill the shelves with records be, because we want to, because we can, but you know, but also yes, because I want all the records just as much as everybody else here wants all the records. <laughs> well, just one thing to say, um, the, the uh, goal here is to be able to reproduce the music that we've created. And Absolutely. that's what vinyl does uh, more stably than um, any other format out there. Uh, you know, you're, I have sessions on Pro Tools 9 that I can't open in Pro Tools 10. Um, Absolutely. So we have to have old formats around. And the, as you know, as an archivist, uh, this is a huge uh, issue. And so many content creators uh, recording all of their music digitally on some, um, uh, 
antiquated, a, a future antiquated uh, format that they will never be able to play that thing back. And um, in five years, in two years. Uh, so you must back up your uh, creation to something that you can guarantee that you can reproduce the music. The, um, the very first piece of music ever recorded was in 1851, as you know, the Claire de Lune piece, uh, but it, uh, if, which was on, uh, it was soot on um, a piece of paper and this girl sings and, um, and this little wire vibrates uh, the uh, signal and draws it onto this um, piece of, uh, you know, soot, through the soot from the fireplace onto this um, uh, piece of paper. And so there's a waveform there. There was no way to re reproduce it until 2008 was the That's first the, time oh, not, that piece yeah. of music was ever played as, as all of us probably know this um, because uh, there was no way to reproduce it. So it was able to, to, you know, take the picture or it was loaded into Pro Tools or whatever. And that was enormous. And uh, when I teach music production uh, or any students or any workshops, I always want to really impress upon them the fact that um, are you confident that you're going to be able to play this back at a later date? Uh, will you always have some medium where you can take that and play it? If tape, yes, it does disintegrate. However, it, uh, if stored correctly, we have some chances. But vi you know, uh, vinyl, uh, you can put it on a turntable, put that stylus on there, and you're going to get sound back out of it. And um, you can't say that with data. No. Definitely not. Ones and zeros are just ons and offs. I just did a really cool project at the beginning of um, the shutdown of everything. Um, a little label from Singapore asked me if I would do an archiving project with them. And so it's a bunch of like girl fronted punk rock bands from like the late 90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And they wanted a way to be able to um, keep that, that music and like put it out into different parts of like different countries and stuff so I did like 47 47 sevens for them and I mean it took like nine million years for them to That's get so there cool. but it was like so cool to just do a bunch of punk rock in a different language that I was like yeah man yes. it, was, it was mono and it was loud and it was awesome and it, I was just like yeah man like this is exactly what I got into this for it was so I mean like that whole archiving moment I'm like here for it and if anybody if anybody watching has something, you know, like your grandma giving you a voicemail and you want that on a little piece of vinyl for you forever, like holler so cool. at me because that is like what I want to do forever. Like <laughs> I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm into just like doing weird little archiving projects. It's like my little pet, my little pet monster with, with um, doing short run. So there's actually a conference coming up about that called uh, Basement Tapes. Uh, that I was involved with last year and have been invited to participate and volunteer for this year because I have uh, reel to reel quarter inch tape machines and um, cassette players and micro cassette players. And the whole point is um, that the general public takes the medium, the reel to the reels, or, you know, back in the day they had these little tape recorders that people uh, did audio letters on yeah. and they yeah uh, and so uh so many of those at the speed of three and three quarters or one and seven eighths um <laughs> you know very very slow but it's dialogue so it didn't have to have a lot of high fidelity yeah um but nobody has a way to reproduce these so this archival um conference that happens here in los angeles hopefully it'll happen in november like it did last year um I the mean, general public can bring those tapes and there's a whole slew of us with all sorts of playback apparatus, um, and people get to hear their grandmother and hear them as a baby and hear 
whatever the, is on these tapes, it is enormously touching. Yeah. And oh, um, yeah. besides uh, somebody, you know, rec somebody had recorded Elvis at, in Vegas on, on a little recorder. And that, that was hilarious to hear. You know, again, the fidelity isn't te terribly great. Or even on those micro cassette um, from um, answering machines. Totally. Mm -hmm. totally. you know, and mes messaging and interviews and things. So uh, it's an issue being able it to uh, reproduce these sounds on, from all these different formats. And then how do you capture that in a stable fashion that can be reproduced for the longest period of time? Like, yeah. I say vinyl. Our archivists become inherently technology hoarders, I think, because you you have to cannibalize machines all the time to make sure that you have at least one in working order for every mm -hmm. single kind of playback machine. Um, I Every archivist I know has just a mountain of playback machines of every, of every kind. Um, well, some just, just for parts. Yeah, they just cannibalize them into like whatever they need, yeah. you know, taking them out. And, it's a yeah, huge it's, issue, as you know. It's technology obsolescence is a problem, but it doesn't happen with vinyl. With vinyl, you'll know it's, yep. it's always the Pull same. Pull it out, put it on. <laughs> you got a turntable and... I mean, you don't even need a turntable. I think everybody saw yeah. that, that viral video going around of that the <laughs> the dude with the hat on the, on the upside down drill. <laughs> it was like... That oh, was amazing, that. and it was yeah. exactly why, like, it, it speaks to how stable and how usable and how forward thinking they were in the 1800s to come up with this crazy format that has just persisted. But that's exactly mm -hmm. it. He, he he turns over a hand drill and like puts the record on it and puts a piece of putty so that he can like amend the speed a little bit and then creates a little cone and a pin and a pin cone and it's just like and it plays and it was like <laughs> it was perfect i mean i was like yep did it damage it. the the recording oh, though i'm i'm sure but sure. <laughs> yeah see that that's a consideration too it you is know? i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to hurt them back but. To kind of what people may not know. I think, you know, we should kind of step back into the pressing process that Vet, uh, that Jet sort of mentioned a little bit. Totally. Um, because I think there's a ton there too that people don't know. So like, people don't know the time, how long it's going to take. Yes. Um, so <laughs> well, also test pressings too. I wanted to bring up test pressings oh, yeah. and, and that element if you want to talk about that. Yeah. So basically, you know, one big thing is I get a lot is I want, what is the sticker on my record? And I'm like, people often mean stickers as center labels. The majority of people don't realize that the labels are baked and then pressed with the vinyl. So, you I know, mean, you hope they're baked properly. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Or they'll explode, which looks kind of cool, but you don't want it. Um, but yeah, so I mean, you get your labels. They have to be a certain kind of paper. You bake them. And then those actually go on either side of the puck in between the stampers to then get pressed. And then people, something that I'm talking to people day in and day out about is overs. Nobody under, understands what overs are. We have to order overs for your print because we can't just say we're going to press 300, 500, 1,000 records, boom, stop. Because this isn't, this process is so old. It's still a boiler. It's still steam. It's mm -hmm. you know, applying pressure. So anything could happen if there's not enough steam. You could get, you know, an issue like non-fill, um, which will sound on your record. You could get stitching on your record. And so once those are pressed and cooled, hopefully they're cooled. We're seeing a lot of warping happening from various plants because things aren't cooled. Um, but, you know. Or sleeving right cool. off the press where it gets scratched. Right. But once that happens, then they have to be quality controlled. So then, you know, we're looking at them for all of those issues. Um, before they then get packaged to then go out to you. So there's a lot of different steps. And like when Nice mentioned, you know, part of the upfront, um, part of that process is your test presses. And so when I tell someone, you know, it could take 10 weeks for their record, they're like, oh my God. So my biggest thing for people wanting to press a record is plan ahead, you know? Like, yes. <laughs> and I need my thing in five weeks. Well, then you're probably going to have to wave a test press because the point with the test presses is to make sure everything is 
you know, the right sequence, the right sound, that there's no developing issues in your metal, something like, you know, a pop or a tick. Um, so those are the, yep. And, the, and that your sides are labeled right, all of that. And so you want to get those, listen through them, um, make sure everything's correct, sign off on them, and then we go into your full run. And so I think a lot of that is not understood. You know, we get a lot of requests for, we want our records in a month. And I'm just like, well, good luck. But the one-offs, the, the one-offs, well, they can sure. yeah. in a um, month. We had, uh, they sent us 10, this is from RTI here in Camarillo, um, and that's uh, after much um, uh, research and uh, getting referrals from various uh, mastering engineers and based on our, it's an independent project, Primal Kings Records, so our process was once we cut it uh, with uh, uh, before we even cut it with Ron McMaster, we had to figure out where it was going to go because that that um, lacquer had to be shipped immediately, correct? So because it it um, changes quality within like a 10 hour period, uh, according to him. The sooner you can ship your um, cut lacquer from the mastering facility to the manufacturing facility, uh, so they can uh, do the processes and uh, create the the stampers and um, so it's a very quick process so you have to uh, look for uh, how much is it going to cost for whatever run that you want to have what is the quality of vinyl do they use virgin vinyl or do they reuse you know recycled vinyl and what are the issues that you you as the the quality level that you want is it 180 is it 200 audiophile does that really make the difference um and um what happened and so they they created the the stampers and then they sent us 10 test pressings and between the band members and myself playing them back on uh we did one playback in our analog studio together on um uh, a techniques turntable uh, and so we all listened to that one and then we each took a, a test pressing home and played it on our different systems and uh, one of the test pressings played on an audio technica uh, turntable that was more of a consumer uh, model um, not a high-end consumer model but um, which they have uh, pulled off the market and uh, recreated for this reason because if there was a heavy bass on uh, the on a lot of vinyl it uh, the shape of the stylus would uh, not stay in place and it would jump out and you'd have crossover and on one of the test pressings um, from all from the same stamper and everything uh, there was one place that on the of course the leader of the band's audio technica turntable it would pop out at the same place so we got it under the microscope and we all did and we looked at it and then we sent sent it back and they said well that's just one in ten the other ten they didn't jump but on his turntable well, it did and he said i'm the general public it has to be if it can't play on a turntable like this with this kind of you know commercial stylus uh we can't have you know, uh, all of these, you're talking about overs. Uh, they said, well, we'll, we can cut it and then we'll give you X amount over to, if for any that gets sent back. And he said, well, we don't want that. Uh, so Ron recut it. And um, that one side for us and to lower the level, just, you know, half a DB made all the difference. So that one little thing wasn't there anymore and it played back perfectly on um you know a, a less than you know stellar turntable but that something that so many of the general public buying vinyl now don't realize uh you can't just buy a crossley turntable and uh you know all they want to do is play vinyl but they don't know the different uh qualities of turntables and stylus and playback capabilities and so you have to 
consider the lowest common denominator in this and who is your target audience and how many returns do you want or um, you know who are, who are you making this record for and right. and so these are all considerations that uh, you know uh, when I've started out everybody wanted you know back in the day you had the best speakers and the best turntables and the best amplifiers and preamps and blah, 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 stylus and all of that now people just it's it's consumable and um, you uh, it has to be able to play on anything. Yeah, and I think a lot of plants like are using different kind of more um, quality control turntables that are more um, friendly to the general public for that reason, because that's what most people are listening on. But also, you know, it could be where if it is appearing on one test press that it's not going to appear on the full run because it could be an issue with a stamper that developed. That's mm -hmm. why, you know, we run a certain amount of test presses and you get a certain amount because you throw out a certain amount as well. So mm -hmm. it is really interesting and it's things that people don't really um, understand. So it's, it's a lot of kind of, again, kind of going back to what I was saying before with the advising and helping, it's that kind of learning process for a lot of people um, to understand. So- Yes. Sorry, Jen, okay. I think it is really, really difficult for a lot of those like high volume plants though, to try and, you know, outfit their QC rooms with a variety of turntables you know what I mean like some of those turntables are are working for like 18 hours a day you know hadn't you know how often are you changing a stylus you know there's a there's a portion of the population that doesn't know how to change a stylus properly or you know what a car what the different cartridges are as well too so they do they do expect a certain price point to you know be playable or whatever but I mean that's I think that goes back into educating the public too as to what their what, what their ex expectations are and what the price point means. It's not a reflection of like what this record is. It's a reflection of how many people have touched it to actually get it into your hands. So I mean, educating oh, people yeah. as to like what a different setup is going to be, but also like you know, anytime I have the luxury of five minutes to be able to review one of my own records on my Instagram, I try and like search out like who cut it, who plated it, like where it was pressed, yada, yada, yada. Because like those details are important and those details mm -hmm. aren't reaching the public. So like, in my opinion, mastering and like mastering is a complete black art. We're the total like wizards of what we do. And nobody understands that part because it's total sorcery but like great <laughs> you know what i mean and like there's so many people that are like you do what what how what Ugh. and i'm like i know i know <laughs> but yeah i would but, never master my own music people say oh well you know there's all these great mastering programs i mm -mm, mm -mm. i'm not a mastering <laughs> engineer you guys uh i can record and i can mix but i don't want to master it because all you guys do all day long is make hit records. You're objective. You're not married to this song like I am. I, I can't. I I I can't possibly be as objective as you can. Also, I every one of you has your different style, your different uh, mastering chain. What you have created to come up with that sound that you do. That's why um, artists do shootouts with you know, uh, mastering engineers, if you send out the same bit to each one of you, you do your, your bit on it. And that's how we choose who we want to master it by what we liked that we heard your style. And it's not right or wrong. It's just, that's how you individually as the mastering engineer artist, that's how you re that's how you mastered it. And mm -hmm. um, so then my decision as a producer is to choose which one makes the most sense for the vision of our product that we want to put out and oh. our music. And so that's, I would never want to do that you, uh, because it's so personal and it's, it is such a subtle art. Every one of you are artists and I absolutely depend on that. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to say about the stylus too, I'm, I don't mean to dominate this, but, but Brittany, and you know this very well, a lot of people don't understand that the shape of the, of the stylus of the needle 
uh, is so important depending on what your purpose is. And if you're going to be making beats and you're going to be DJing and you need to go back and forth and back and forth, you need to have that conical stylus. So it's rounded instead of the one that, uh, you know, only goes in one direction because you can't go back on that, you know? You can't it go also back on that. <laughs> oh, you're muted. I can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Well, you know, and also like coming from the DJ field, depending on how often you back cue, if you got a straight versus a S curve style tone arm, all mm -hmm. of that, you know, comes into play. Cause a lot of people, when they ask about um, their first turntable, well, I'm like, well, what are you, what are your intentions with this turntable? <laughs> like, are you just listening? Are you just, you know, and I saw somebody have put in the comment on about how to confront family, friends and loved ones about cross leaves without seeming like a snob. And I feel like, you know, sometimes the short answer is you can't do it without seeming like one. You know, you just, some people have to start sometimes with limited or something that might be of lower quality just to get a foot in the door. And then they sometimes they'll notice, hey, this sounds kind of like crap. So I might want to get a better, you know, turntable or a better needle or a better this or a better that, or maybe I should arrange my speakers differently. And I think, you know, and, you know, a lot of us get so um, comfortable, you know, know because vinyl can be very pinky up nowadays versus where it used to just be the the main uh format for a lot of years is is that you know with whether it's anything if you're in the photography video ceramics that there's always like your crappy starter kit a lot of times you know there's always something mm -hmm. that kind of whets the appetite and sometimes some people like hey i had a little crappy crossly it collects dust in the back and I'm cool with Spotify you know and some people are like you know what I know I needed more and it kind of sent me down this final rabbit hole and so you know I just think I just think that's the beautiful thing about it like as long as we're opening up conversations and people know I'm sorry I'm like that, that. <laughs> as long as people know that there's a community that then they can tap into and still sharpen and still like where we're talking now there's a lot of people especially women that don't know that the questions you have can be answered. And it's a lot of people who could point you in the right directions. And, you know, so long story short on that with the needles and whatnot, so. No, it's Agreed. so important. Um, go ahead. I just, my thought went somewhere else, sorry. <laughs> Let me come back. Probably uh, the questions that were submitted. Um, so let's see. I think we had a question here for Amanda. How can you tell us about how you moved from archives into your position at Universal? Uh, does being a formal archivist inform the work that you currently do? And if so, how? It does. Um, a lot of, um, one of the things that I learned when I started um, working in digital distribution, kind of at the very beginning was, um, kind of how all of that works on the back end. And I learned very quickly that a lot of the problems in digital distribution um, were coming from metadata. Um, and I really went back to school to get my degree in archives, not only because I wanted to learn everything about the history of sound and work on preserving these stories, but also because I knew that no matter where my career was gonna take me, I was gonna to have to understand metadata. It is the foundation of literally everything. And it is the gaping black hole secret of a dumpster fire in the music industry right now. <laughs> well said, my dear. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It is the secret that no one is talking about and everyone is absolutely ignoring um i that is a whole discussion on itself but i will say that um going back to study how information storehouses have functioned and evolved throughout the eternity of our previous history as humans and how we collect information store it and just protect it through time um really boils down to these tiny pieces of information, data points and how you track them and how we can organize and deal with that. And when you think about, to bring this into a music perspective, think about Discogs, like 
almost everybody I'm sure here has been on Discogs, has used it, has searched something through there. And to think about the fact that that is almost entirely user generated data that is just nerds like us going in there and typing all this stuff in and think that most of that information has never been tracked until this comes. Like, what, are you kidding me? Like, seriously, there's no, labels don't have that information. And, you know, nobody does. A lot does. of it is incorrect. And, and it's very yes, hard like to fix. If 90 percent of it is incorrect. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just stunned at when I look at uh, my discographies or whatever. It's like, yeah, well, mostly it's, my name's not even spelled right. And so a lot uh, of my credits aren't there. Um, these are all this is how we get paid. And, exactly. Uh, this is our revenue streams. And the, as you're saying, this is absolutely critical to it making critical. a living on this. <laughs> getting your metadata you know all of all of you artists out there who want when it, you say you know so and so play my song and it comes up somebody else's song because your metadata had you know one uh small A space in the wrong and, place yeah, or, space, yeah. It's, it's the tiniest <laughs> hyphen thing. oh yeah. yes and and they'll they'll screw things up like um you know, I, I will have done one song on this record when I had done the whole thing, or I'd done one episode of a TV show and I did six seasons of it, you know, and yeah. it's, uh, but that was the one that was submitted for an Emmy. And so that's the only one nobody knows. And it's just like, oh, it's so incorrect. It's and so it's absolutely essential that you be accountable for that metadata of yours. If you want to ensure that it is if you're going to sign off on it um you know make sure you look through it make sure it's absolutely right it's absolutely consistent and it's so and complete intensive it's just, yes. it just drives me cuckoo that's another reason why i hire uh real um mastering engineers because i'm a, I'm a knucklehead at that stuff I, and, <laughs> and you you guys have your production teams or you have your own way of doing it and you know that that if it's going to go to spotify if it's going to go to title if it's going to go to apple if it's going to go you know whoever wraps it uh, i don't even know anymore um they all have their different uh requirements oh yeah yeah and every it, digital service provider is different but even if it's just a retailer you know when you're thinking about you know how do you buy a record through like a larger online retailer it's still that metadata that drives that purchasing power. So it's not just digital distribution, it's still physical distribution that's being driven by these little pieces of information. And so learning that in the archival sphere allowed me to kind of pivot back towards how are we solving problems um, for artists that are putting out music today. And so it, it very much, um, my. I went kind of like this in terms of connecting to that, but becoming an advocate and, and for metadata as just brutally boring as it can be for a lot of people, even people that work in music glaze over as soon as you say the word metadata and they like just want to like immediately disappear and they hope that you don't run after them as you're like <laughs> trying to like just implore them to, to, you know, deal with it. And um, I am, I have had like the biggest compliment of my life, I think I would say, is probably when the, um, <laughs> one of the kind of the head of the archives department um, at the grad school that I went to, I, I had lunch with him and he said, I just, I can't conceive of how you managed to make music metadata just exciting and and totally like interesting he's like will you teach a class on it and I was like no I will not do that but <laughs> I will continue to run after people and try to implore them to 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 confront it but and to um to to help musicians through working on music metadata and and trying to come up with new ways is to distribute music and that's that's what I do so I don't know if that answered the question but hopefully <laughs> how long was your program is what I'm curious uh, when um, 
Now, is it a it's master's a, program? Did you already have a degree and then you went back and got a, a special degree in archiving? How long did yes. that take you? It's a two-year program, um, full-time master's degree. I went to this University of Texas at Austin because uh, they're one of the few programs that have a, a hands-on um, like audio studio. Not Most of the schools of information, which is what they're called for archives, um, are deal with sound in, in a theoretical manner because moving image, sound, time-based mediums are messy and expensive and people hate them and they're like the red-headed stepchildren of the you know archival world because it takes a lot of time and energy and passion to deal with them. Um, mostly it takes a lot of money. Um, and so, you know, it's it's a challenging thing so you want to pick a program that has that hands-on and kind of aspect to it yeah. and then i started um i joined the association for recorded sound um, uh which brings to arsk yeah arsk and uh, now i'm a, ah, i'm a board member um, oh, fantastic. <laughs> and so uh yeah it's one of the few professional organizations that brings together collectors um, that are not professionals with uh, professionals that work in yeah. sound and, and really creates a community around recorded sound um, through time. There's a lot of research in terms of kind of the actual manufacturing and physical objects and also in terms of historical context and discographies and, and stories about musicians and um, and all of that. So it, it spans the entirety of recorded sound. And I it's cannot recommend organization. I just absolutely. I love Join. It. Their conferences are, are, are so yes. worth attending. And the, the presentations that people have, everything from uh, recreating a broken wax cylinder, which got a standing ovation, to absolutely. Frank Zappa's <laughs> uh, archivist wondering how do you. Uh, archive um, uh, pneumatic of 1630 tapes yes. that he was uh, he was one of the pioneers of digital and now they're all disintegrating and what and she was desperate you know uh, yeah uh, and it's then really cool you know record labels the uh, 1920s Mexican record labels and all these just fascinating collections people mixed mixed cassettes you know yeah. people uh, you know, from from the 80s. every kind. It was it's ARSC A R S C Association ARSC dot org. Check yeah. them out. <laughs> Association of Recorded Sound Collectors and it's professionals and enthusiasts and it's it's just if you're into this stuff, it's fantastic. And I yeah. think this is a good segue to because we only have a couple more minutes here to everyone sort of providing um, any resources suggestion to both how to get your foot in the door and how to make um, our industry more inclusive. Um, you know, both gender and race, I think, have come up sort of as a general question um, that we were sort of presented with. So yeah, I would say resources and what you all think that we can do to make a more inclusive vinyl community. So um, whoever wants to start, have at it. <laughs> well, I wanted to comment on Brittany uh, back at, when you were saying that uh, when you were first going to record stores, you were nobody else looked like you, and uh, I my thought was celebrate that and put that out there. You you became a thing, and um, yeah, and and to that you have to make lemonade out of this stuff and uh, be that uh, be that person. You don't want to be like anybody else. You, you want to be that one that uh, that stands out because that's how people um, are attracted to you for what you do. So don't go, oh no, you know I don't look like anybody else. That's that's really good. And also, if you speak more than one language, that's really good. And um, and also be really good at what you do and feel confident about it. And uh, it, it, you don't have to know everything starting out. Nobody expects you to. You and don't act like you do because that's not good either. Uh, but be confident in what you do know. And uh, if somebody asks you to do something or asks you something, say, "Well, uh, I don't know that right now, but I can find out." And um, and then go find out. But uh, those those are ways 
that uh, have always worked. When I started, you know, there weren't there, no women, and um, and but that didn't even occur to me that that would be an issue. I did not let I did not play that card at all because I just wanted to do this thing. So whatever that thing is you want to do, just focus on that and um, uh, use your differences as a, a calling card and embrace those and celebrate those. And that's how you will go forward because people will pick up on how you feel about yourself. If you're not confident and you think, oh, I can't do this because I'm a girl or I'm, or I'm gay or I'm trans or you know I'm a person of color whatever that is that then somebody else is going to say okay you're right you can't because that's how you feel if, don't let that be who that what defines you what defines you is that thing that you want to do yeah Brittany um I would I'll, I'll piggyback on that and the thing is is like you know representation and exposure is is important like I would say to anybody who wants to make vinyl more accessible and more of a, like uh, what people consider is, um, I guess, antiquated. And I like what Lenise said earlier about future antiquated, because like coming from the DJ space, still most of my gigs might be on Serato, but we all know if you don't do a firmware update, everybody, there's no more vinyl record pools anymore. People aren't really digging for records. So all DJs are using the same equipment, have the same access to songs, and it's nothing to really distinguish you. You know, and with Shazam, you know, there's little to no exclusivity a lot of the times anymore. So I say like, if, if you do DJ or in the community, or if you play the music, like literally like make an effort to be seen spinning vinyl. You know what I'm saying? There's so many portable, lightweight, you know, as we call them like chick friendly systems that you don't have to break your back or get a dolly to like lug in the place. You know, like I DJ vinyl as much as I can and I'm, I'm outside of the shop because I have the vinyl DJ in there. So like when people come and buy records, they see records are being spun. They see everyday people from like regular collectors who are forced to get on the turntables. Cause if you shop with me more than two, three times and I see you've got some funk and, and some good taste, I make you hop right on those turntables. And I'll show you how to use the crossfader all That's the way cool. to people who are traveling, you know what I'm saying, professional DJs, but just to kind of make it like an equalizer. And the thing about it is like, people have to see that vinyl is like a perfect design. Every controller, every technological piece, or I call them toys at this point, that they used to trigger music is still based off of two turntables and some type of mixer or, or um, crossfader technology. And, you know, no matter where music goes, vinyl is, is still going to be there. So, like, people have to see it. Like, I'll say... I can be DJing a Motown set or doing a dance party with Serato and I'm spinning songs at a minute, uh, a song per minute. And it's just like a crazy whirlwind of energy. But if I'm taking my time, just doing some simple beat matching and, and, and I'm spinning 45s or regular vinyl, people are like looking over the DJ booth. People want to see what it is. Cause it's like, I'm literally bringing archives, you know, with me. It's like, I'm, I'm the, I'm literally like, Instead of just being a DJ, I realized at 33 now, people look at me as like a funky librarian, which is like way cooler. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like I'm a Own that title. Like, awesome. You yeah, I love it's that. Funky like, librarian. <laughs> it's like I went to the archives. I dug out these scrolls. I want to share it to, with you. Like I told people, like if you've ever heard like Kissed by Prince on 45, the original, versus like, because I know that song like, he made sure they took the bass tracks out. He's like, I want the drums to be mixed where the drums, the kicks are gonna be enough for the low end. And versus where I think of at my age, I only really remember the remastered version or CD that I heard on radio. But when I got the 45 and I went back and listened to it, I'm just like, what is going on, right? Like, I've never heard this version. And it's sometimes also, you know, that Vinyl is timeless, like vinyl is forever. And the more of these, and I love the term of uh, future antiquated, because because planned obsolescence is such a part of our society now. Like, you know, it's like, I hate buying a new phone because I know it's designed to be crap in two years because a new one's coming out. Or I know they're gonna throttle like my processing speed just until I get angry enough and get a new one. But vinyl is vinyl is vinyl you know what i'm saying like 
I spent all this money on Amen. these like crap controllers, but the, but they, but the controllers, if you know now, have phono lines. You know what I'm saying? So it's like even the controllers had to circle back, and it's almost like you don't really have a professional controller if it can't double for vinyl. So vinyl is always coming back, and I feel like just like um, um, you know photography. Like I was one of the last years that my high school had a dark room before things went digital. You know the way people are producing even more like after thousands of zoom videos a day when i go and produce like i'm working on a dollar setup you know what i'm saying i used to think those are the biggest nerdiest weirdos and they were just had this weird scene but like now that everything's online it's like i crave to touch things i want to make beats and look out the window instead of at a screen so i think now that we've kind of gotten to this like postmodern where nothing really is what it's whatever you want it to be and nothing means anything where people want to have something that they can touch and that they can feel you know, and vinyl to me sonically embodies that like realness, you know, and sometimes now I love it how in certain circles you're as an artist, you don't even have chops unless you have a vinyl. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was kind of like a hipster thing for a second where it's like, oh, yeah, whatever. But it's just like people want to be like, I want to hear what you sound like on vinyl. And it, and, it, and it means something, you know, so I just say like be out, spin vinyl, like and and if you're in a smaller city that's even better because like you can be the spearhead of your vinyl scene you know what i'm saying you know if you're cool with the bar set up a turntable tuesday where you bring your turntable and invite people to bring their vinyl and share it with others it's a great way to get conversations and just you know just build the scene like you know it's and it really it starts with you and especially if you're a woman if you're like person of color if you're whatever if you're different like that's you know that like that is your calling card and somebody's gonna see it some especially some little girl's gonna be like oh well shit i can do that too yeah you know i was just very yeah. determined and stubborn but i know not most people are like that you got to sometimes see it to really uh you know envision it so like i said you know just just if you've got this stuff bring it out be social with your uh with your vinyl you know like dj vinyl if you're a dj get with it like have a vinyl night or just even like some people have supper clubs and book clubs have a vinyl dinner party with friends and everybody brings something and it's just like you know and and it's it's it, it gets really cool really fast and just maintain it and make sure you can do it regularly you know like if it's once a week or once a month or something that you can maintain because with the periodicity of it like people will appreciate it and people will show up and it's a people that it's what you're saying over and over again is that it's the human element that makes a difference it's not about the technology it's not about the gear it's not actually even about that black thing or whatever color it is it's it's about the human interaction and the tactile uh, and the sharing of the experience and um and the and the person and personality uh involved in it and so it's about the song and it's about the people and one last thing I wanted to say uh, to encourage everybody, when I was coming up, I was so myopic. Um, I didn't need anybody to tell me no. I needed them to tell me how. And um, just keep that in mind. If somebody tells you no, says that the girls don't do this or, or trans people don't do this or there aren't enough jobs or anything like that, somebody's doing this stuff. Somebody is doing it. It might as well be you. And uh, if that's your, your joy and your passion, make that make you that person that's doing it and seek out the people who will tell you how not know yeah and i mean you know women in vinyl is there for that reason if you see somebody that's inspiring to you please reach out to me i'm more than happy to contact that person and ask them if they feel comfortable to discuss with you what they do in further detail um you know maybe someday we'll be able to evolve it into a job board of its own um there is a 2 im job board the nam job board um, and I'll send out something, post something on Women in Vinyl as well with those resources. But yeah, I mean, we're all here because we want to help and, um, you know, you should feel free to reach out to us and, and we're, yeah, we're here to help you get your foot in the door. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's one of the things that I have seen in the questions too. Um, a lot of these incredible ladies have education in their field and in our vinyl business and i did not so do not let school stand in your way that doesn't i mean especially with what jed and i do 
it's definitely like a learned apprentice kind of you got I did it learn vinyl it's yeah. exactly and and even to and even to a point probably even Lizette like um I keep calling you the wrong name man um but everybody has had to learn from someone so it's not it's not like you are going to go into a classroom and you're going to learn everything that you need to know. So not don't let that stand in your way. Mm-hmm. Um, Denise, I don't know why I keep calling you the wrong name. I'm so for <laughs> Just don't call me late for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Will not and would love to take you one day when I'm allowed to go to your country again. Um, <laughs> Vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but to anybody that's interested in any portion of the process, like send us send any of us a note we're all super approachable we have instagram instagram is one of the best tools i think to propagate vinyl culture if you look at mm-hmm. most of the like the hashtags on instagram and maybe it's just my algorithm but it's all vinyl collection vinyl ig blah 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 but the number of interactions that i've had with people that want to get involved in vinyl is huge on the daily it's it's connected a bunch of random lathe cutters and mastering engineers and things like that because what jed and i do is very insular we're not like Brittany, and we're not out playing records and we're not out in the community doing we're the hermits exactly and that's exactly what we are so sometimes and even to jen and even archiving and it working in a studio like there's a lot of times if you think that it's going to be this like big social party, like, I'm sorry, but this is the wrong job for you. <laughs> if you think that it's going to be like, no, no. and hookers and liquor and parties <laughs> and stuff like that may have been in the sixties and seventies, but baby, it is over. Yeah. <laughs> nobody has those budgets anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody has the fun that they did. And that's maybe why music has devolved a bunch of the ways. Well. <laughs> Um, I don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, every single industry has lots of unique challenges. Um, you know, gender it sometimes can be a barrier to entry. When I was standing on the platform waiting for the guy that was creating my lathe for me to pick me up to teach me how to use it, he said, Oh, you're a girl. And I said, Surprise! And he said, girls don't do this. And I was like, well, I'm here. So oh, screw you. See, I mean, and he, like- and he was like, at the, at the end of like my training and all that kind of stuff, he's like, you're going to make great records because you're here for the right reason and you want to do it. He's like, it's what makes your heart beat. And I can see that. So, I mean, your passion will always drive you. Um, there's a hundred different ways to get into vinyl. There's a bunch of different ways to work with vinyl. You can work at a record store. You can work for a label. I mean, you could start a label if you are crazy and want to. You can, you know, work at a hi-fi shop. You could work at a guitar store. You can learn recording software by working at a guitar store. There's a million different ways and there are a million different points of entry. So, I mean, we're just a cross section of different points, but that's not the only way. And it's not just a record pressing plant that you can work at. So, I mean, everybody has different gifts and there's room for Mm -hmm. everyone, literally everyone, especially in this industry. So, don't let anything really stand in your way kind of figure out what is your gift and then we can like there's different ways to apply that in every scenario Mm -hmm. so i mean for all of the questions that that we have i mean you know maybe that's one of the reasons that vinyl does have such a cult following because it is it's a heritage item that has been passed down from person to person to person. I have records in my collection that are shellacs and they're from 1904 and they're super weird. And Amanda, I have lots of questions about like how to hermetically seal them and restore them to their once prior glory. And we'll talk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know? So there's like, there's lots I want to learn that. Yeah. There's lots of different ways. Like, so, um, you know, I, I just want to encourage anybody that has sat through this panel and watched and participated to, you know, just like think big there, every single piece of all of these processes exist on the internet. I mean, coming into cutting lacquers and cutting vinyl and cutting short run has led me to want to learn how to plate. And like, Mm -hmm. that's some sorcery too. And I am like this close to buying like an at-home electroplating you're gonna have like a full vinyl 
Oh yeah. oh yeah, I'm the one-stop shop baby. Exactly. But that's exactly it. You can be as OCD and control freaky as you want with vinyl, and that's the other beautiful part because you can be a total audiophile and be like, oh yeah, Jeff got this is my Ortophone 50 for playing <laughs> rock and roll, and this is my this for playing jazz. You know, like you can do that. You can bring out your MVP for whatever. You can <laughs> have a bunch of different speakers. You can do, or you can have a 1957 dual 560 from Germany that you've never changed the cartridge on that you've been listening to your whole life because that's what I have because it was my mom's and she gave me that and was my record player and nothing will ever sound as good as anything that is played on that record player nothing also, forever <laughs> we have you um, your vinyl sorry I know we have to run out but I have to ask you uh, how do you clean your vinyl? Ooh, um, I mean, I have a I have a cheeky sponsorship with the Groove Washer, so <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay. sponsored uh, by at least I have those, a disc cleaner. Guys. Yeah, you know, I love have those guys. Um, I have an old school brush, yeah, and then I have a microfiber one as well. Yeah, oh. one of these with the the doodad and yep. learn how to use it correctly. Oh, you know. No. Um, Taking good care of your vinyl is absolutely essential too. I mean, that's that a whole other conversation, Amanda. It truly is, but that has to, so think about that, everybody out there. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> yeah, any, Next any, time. Questions, any yeah. questions and wants me to pump their tires, I will do this for you all day. You want some leadership and guidance into a super punk rock DIY way into the music business? I'm your girl, holler at me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, I've done it all. We, ac <laughs> we actually have like several other, like a huge list of questions from the, mm. everyone who's registered. But since we're out of time, maybe this is like a good opportunity to just for, for the Women in Vinyl website to like, um, we can gather our, our answers offline yeah. and we, we can release it as like uh, an article by Jen down the road. But yeah, we're, um, we're, we're really eager to answer as many of the questions that you guys submitted. Um, but yeah, I think starting going to the womeninvinyl.com website and looking at everyone's profiles and seeing what everyone does and just probably following each of these facilities on their social media pages. For example, like Furnace posts a lot of job openings. And I always like get excited of all the job openings that, that get posted there because um, for many who are not uh, familiar with vinyl, there's a lot of like job opportunities that are just in this vinyl industry alone that not a lot of people know exist. So by following these women and, and um, their, their job um, facilities on social media, you really get to open your eyes to all the opportunities that you guys can explore. So I think that's also another way to, to really celebrate the format and just really expand women in vinyl in general. Yeah, and we all have expa like expansive networks. Like yes. Jen, not Jen might not know exactly the person that you want to talk to, but maybe Jet and I do. Maybe Amanda, you know, there's there's a million ways to skin a cat. So, I mean, not that I'm advocating animal cruelty. Jen, I love your cats. <laughs> I, I want to know how to save the chat. Um, I just hit, I went under the three dots there. I want to save all these questions and every and all the comments. And I know when you, uh, quit the zoom then the, the chat goes away well yeah. we'll copy paste it on, on our shared document thank yeah. you for all thank the questions you. and we'll all coordinate after to get those put together and i'll do a, a share on women in vinyl for that for everybody wonderful thanks yeah. awesome well thanks everybody so much for doing yep. this to the sound girls and for everybody that hung out with us um this was a great opportunity thank you to be able to do something like this again yeah, I flew. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for Happy including Saturday. me. And, Happy yeah, Saturday. For being thank here. you guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Awesome. Thank Washington you so time. much. Bye. Yeah, be safe out there. Wear a mask. Go. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>